This video is a visual exploration of the split complex numbers, an interesting two-dimensional number system. They're kind of like the traditional complex numbers. The split complex are defined as x plus yj, where x and y are real and j squares to 1. This makes the split complex different from the legit complex, where i squares to negative 1. i is useful. It unlocks the ability to square to a negative, which can't be done in the reals. But j doesn't add any value. 1 and negative 1 already square to 1. j is just a copycat. But still, it has some interesting properties. The split complex numbers are sometimes called the hyperbolic numbers, because this hyperbola is their unit circle. In the legit complex, the unit circle is an actual circle, all the numbers where x squared plus y squared equals 1. And we could also say this is all the numbers with size equal to 1. This is a useful measurement of size, because the size of any a times the size of any h equals the size of ah! When complex numbers multiply, so do their sizes, just like the real numbers. If we want this size property to work in the split complex, this plus has to turn into a minus. To get the unit circle, we set the size equal to 1, giving us the equation for this hyperbola. But it feels weird to call this a circle. Instead of using size, we could define a circle to be round boy, the same shape in both systems. Now watch what happens when all these points are squared. The shape's the same with legits, but the shape is lame in the splits. Why is it straight? A simple line. Let's calculate. See what we find. This part's real for any square. Snowmobile. Polar bear. This is the size from the legit complex numbers. Since the input is a circle, all points have size 1, so the output is fixed at 1 in the real axis. It only varies in the up -y down -y axis, therefore a straight line. Using different input shapes, we get more interesting results. But we notice that the split result is always kind of a trapezoid. It falls between these two lines. The line where real equals imaginary, and where real equals negative imaginary. All the square numbers are in this section, and we can prove that. The section is to the right of the lines, where the reals increase, so the real part is greater or equal. We just need to show that these equations are true for all split complex squares. If we square any number, this is the real part, and this is the imaginary. By moving things around, we now just need to show that the left foot sides are at least zero. And that's simple. They're both equal to some real number squared. And all real squares are at least zero, so these equations are true. The split squares are all in this section. But what about the split cubes? With the third power, the splits are in every section, and they make a kind of x shape. It's not just this input. Other shapes also make an x. We see something similar with the fourth power but it's just the right half of an x. x. Any even power is also a square, so it has to be in this section. But the fifth power is odd, so it makes a full x. Then the sixth power makes a x, and the seventh is an x, and the eighth is a x. This pattern continues. The most extreme is the inverse function. Infinite x. It stretches off into the diagonals because diagonals have no inverse. To see why, let's take the diagonal numbers 1 plus j and 1 minus j, then multiply them. We do a little alge, then end up with 0. So if 1 plus j had an inverse, these would cancel, but then we get 1 minus j equal to 0, which is not true. The inverse of a diagonal can't exist. So as the inputs approach the diagonal, their inverses approach diagfinity. This is another good demonstration of why the split complex are called hyperbolic numbers. And let's take a further look at this equation. It's weird that two non-zero numbers multiply to zero. These numbers are special, and they're even more special if we cut them in half. This is called e. Watch what happens when we square it. We do a little alge, then end up with 1 minus j over 2, the same as e. 
e equals its own square. And the other number, e hat, also squares to itself. But I think it's unfair that this one has a hat, so we'll give the first e some shoes. We have that e hat and e shoes multiply to zero. And also e hat plus e shoes equals one, and e hat minus e shoes equals j. As an exercise, prove these equations. They're really useful, especially since e hat and e shoes form a basis. They make this diagonal grid. Any split number is some x e hat plus y e shoes. And if we square the number, then e hat and e shoes multiply to zero, so this term disappears. And since the e's square to themselves, those squares disappear. We're left with x squared e hat, and x is real, so the e hat is non-negative. And then we have y squared e shoes, meaning that e shoes is also non-negative. This is another proof that all square splits are in this section. The e's can also help us understand those x shapes. Starting with a circle, then taking it to the third, then the fifth, and so on, it approaches an x. Any point on the input circle can be defined by its angle with e hat. The point is cosine of theta gloves times e hat plus sine of theta gloves times e shoes. If we take this point to the nth power, then any term that has both e hat and e shoes will disappear since they multiply to zero. We only get the terms with all e hats and all e shoes. And since the e's square to themselves, we don't even need the powers on them. These e's make exponents a breeze. We kind of just dropped the parentheses. And if theta gloves is zero degrees, then we end up with just the first of the e's. So when we extend the value of n to a hundred, a thousand, or a million and ten, n can ascend again and again, and this point will stay fixed, like a mannequin in a clothing store. Because they're not real people, you know, they don't move. Well, you can move and position them, but they, they don't move by themselves. Anyway, if we take a horizontal point, where theta gloves is 45 degrees, then we get powers of 0.71. So as n increases, these values decrease, getting closer and closer to zero. And a point between the horizontal and diagonal, like where theta gloves is 30 degrees, will have different values. They both approach zero, but the e hat shrinks slower, so the point also approaches the diagonal. This is why we see an x. Thanks to the e's, powers are easy. Well, at least integer powers. The square root is weird. If we square a triangle, then root it, we end up with four triangles. One has four different square roots, and the same is true for most squares. But if we take the root of the triangle itself, we get just one shape. Only a quarter of the numbers have four square roots. The rest have none, so on average, there's one root each. Although actually, there are a few exceptions. As an exercise, find the numbers with one or two roots. They don't have the full four, but it's better than nothing. It would be nice if everything had a root, like in the legit complex numbers. And they can help! Let's mix the splits with legits to get the splitjit complex numbers. We'll have i squared to negative 1 and j squared to positive 1, then ij squared to... huh. Should it be negative 1 or positive 1? In the negative 1 case, we do a little alge and find that i and j are commutative. These are called the bi-complex numbers. In the positive 1 case, we do a little alge and find that they're anti-commutative. They prefer to work differently than the bi-complex. These are called the split quaternions. So now let's compare the roots in these systems. Here's a cube root in the split quaternions. Let's spin the cube. Cool! Another spin. Oh no, it disappeared! We spun it out of the root zone. Half of the numbers have no root. Even j have no root. As an exercise, show why. So using the split quaternions didn't fix the root issue. But the bi-complex numbers do. Their cube root is always defined, and it looks really cool. It's a lot denser than the input cube because almost every number has four roots.
It's a much better distribution than the split quaternions. Although, interestingly, the split quaternions have a small amount with infinite roots. The roots of zero form this paraboloid. As an exercise, 20 jumping jacks. One, two, three. Thanks to my current supporters, Garbageth Boof Tutor, Balek, Elliot OK, and Savoa. And thanks to you for watching. I linked some code below, so go play around with that. And I'll see you next time.